it's really uh, such an honor to me to get to sit across from you tonight and talk about this book that has been a long time in the making. Um, many of you know who write about and study the internet. Uh, I assume that's about a quarter of the people here and the other three quarters were just stepped out to get out of the rain. And so you don't actually even know where you are and why you're here. Uh, so just bear with us. But you know, I think um, it's, it's really a pleasure for me to get to talk to you about kind of the making of this book and, and also to do it this way because some of you may have seen me talk about the book before, maybe not, but uh, I'd like to unpack it a little more casually this way. So let me first say that, uh, you know, the, the one thing probably a lot of people know is that this book was inspired by the um, the black girls in my life, you know, the young women in my life. The main primary one is actually here with us tonight, and this is her first time being at one of my talks, um, but my stepdaughter is here, Jillian, and so uh, I just wanted to, you all to know that the real inspiration is right here on the first row. So now um, she hates me, and it's fine, <laughs> it's fine. So I will say that, let me just give you a little like backup on me, uh, because the bio doesn't really say it all. I, <clears throat> I started out kind of in my young adult life. Uh, I was an activist, you know, at the undergraduate level. I was really involved in issues like keeping student tuition low in California, fighting for financial aid fighting for educational opportunity program. I, I worked you know, very hard to try to defeat Proposition 209 in California and Proposition 187. Now most of you were not born back then, but these were the initiatives that were really the kind of the anti-affirmative action, anti-immigrant initiatives that were um, incubated in California. And uh, we're seeing much of the aftermath of that now all over the, the country. And um, those things really formed me. I remember thinking so much that policy, uh, policy and the allocation of resources was really what mattered in people's lives, whether they knew it or not. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went to work, uh, you know, my kind of first sociological study, I was a sociology undergraduate major, and uh, my first study was looking at how there were no grocery stores for example, on the west side of Fresno. So I grew up in Fresno, California. I went to Fresno State. I'm a working class kid, first gen college. And uh, I looked at how the, the patterns of segregation really were manifest in the most simple things, like you couldn't get groceries if you lived on the black side of town or if you were poor. And the buses in Fresno would stop running at 7 p.m. So, I mean, that seems implausible here to New Yorkers, but I will tell you, you know, imagine what that's like. You're trying to work, get your kids, you know, live your life, and then you need to get groceries and you can't get a bus. So those things were, were formative for me as a young adult, kind of growing up in a very racially and economically segregated community, a kind of community where, for example, I can remember being in high school and the Klan coming out in their full, I mean, is it fair to call it regalia? No. It's garb. I don't know. Costumes. Yeah. Costumes Let's is a good one. Costumes. Yeah, costumes. The Klan out in their costumes at the mall, at Fashion Fair Mall, uh, it, with a table recruiting people, you know, with their like pointy costume hats and, the, mm -hmm. and their faces showing. And, uh, you know, that's just like another Saturday in the town that I grew up in. I remember uh, being in high school when I got my first car and I couldn't drive to Clovis. Clovis was the kind of adjacent uh, town, kind of like Champaign and Urbana in Illinois. This like sister cities a bit in a bit, uh, one significantly larger than the other. And Clovis was a place where it was a sundown town. Mm -hmm. If you were black or a person of color, you couldn't, you just didn't go there after the sun went down. Mm -hmm. So these things were very formative for me in my young life as a teenager and a young adult. And, uh, and of course, I also grew up in a family 
that this is all the stuff that's not in the book that you guys are getting a chance to hear about, but they certainly informed the book. I can remember, um, you know, my, my mother was white, my father was black, and I can remember, you know, growing up in Fresno. Fresno was not a place for interracial marriages or, or community or family. I've been to Fresno once. You know what I'm saying? I've, I know that pain. I'm just saying yeah. it by circumstance. One of one. It's, it's a no good. It's so I was really the only person I knew, in fact, like me growing up in the seventies and the eighties. It wasn't until I went to college that I met another person who had like an interracial, you know, interracial parents. I didn't Mm -hmm. that. And that also makes you acutely aware of things like race because uh, my own personal lived experience was one of, you know, I can remember being like three or four years old and like putting my, you know, give me your hand, Joan, because you're like my mom. Yeah. And I would put my hand on my mom's and I'd say, why aren't we the same color? You know, these mm-hmm. kinds of things that probably other kids may or may not even think about. Mm-hmm. Um, but those kinds of things become formative for you about like, what is race? What are, what is difference? What, what, what's, what, what is the meaning of it? Is it important? Someone help me understand these things. And of course, those things being shaped in a bigger context of the type of city and community that I uh, was raised in. So, you know, of course, it, it, by the time I uh, went to college, I, uh, you know, I was looking to try to imagine myself as a thinker and not a person who had to tell a lot of jokes to kind of survive. We still do. I mean, we I have don't a know. Blast. I mean, I really wanted a career in stand up and somehow I ended up in you, an academic. Later, so uh, you know, at 8:15 after the cheese anyone, is done, if there are any after agents the, here, after I'm the wine is flowed, I'm just saying we will turn the mics back on. Just dim the light, just get a yeah. spot. It's cool. Yeah. So and you I, can pitch us on raw water. And I I'll, I have my raw water presentation ready. Um, okay, so these these dynamics about like kind of surviving my own growing up. Uh, and of course I was thriving in some of these places too, but going to Fresno state and then becoming really involved in activism and, you know, doing these studies and looking at how there were no grocery stores, for example, on the West side of Fresno and why was that? Uh, and, Uh, I went to work in corporate America for about 15 years and I thought that that would be the way because, you know, in my naive kind of early 20 something self, I thought, well, it's just because companies don't know that they're discriminating. (laughs) Don't they? Isn't that it? I mean, it's maybe, but I have a feeling that through social media, they have learned. I believe now they know these lessons. I believe now. I believe they have always known. Pepsi learned a lesson. Well, listen, I mean, you know, these ideas about, uh, you know, redlining and segregation, I mean, it's such an honor to even be talking about this in front of my colleague, Charlton McElwin, who's here, who's, you know, the genius who's written about the way in which the internet is segregated like a city. And if you don't know his work, you just mob him after the the event because he's, he's brilliant. Uh, these phenomena have been with us for a long time. They predate, predate the internet. And yet here I was kind of, um, going into work in corporate America, thinking that I could help redirect, um, and influence resources toward the right kinds of possibilities. And in some cases I was able to do that and worked in teams where I could do that. And sometimes we couldn't. Um, but that was happening alongside my kind of growing up with the internet because, you know, I got online, I'm going to call it maybe 89 or 90. I feel like I got email in 89 mm-hmm. or 90. Oh, wow. It's really, and I remember getting emails. So this is where you probably don't want to invest in my raw water idea because <laughs> I also thought email would never take off. I thought it was dumb. I was like, why would anyone ever want to sit at their computer all day and type? That seems like a terrible job. And here we are. That's my here, job now. That is your job now. So yep. I, uh, yeah, I, I bet against email and I was wrong. Also voicemail, dumb, <laughs> super dumb. So I'm not a good uh, forecaster. Like I'm, I can't, I'm not a visionary about the future technologies. But I will say <laughs> that uh, I had been on the internet for a long time before the graphic user interface, before Mosaic and Netscape, certainly by the time AOL came on. I mean, my mom was a graphic designer 
and she was the second person in Fresno to have a Mac. Oh, my goodness. Do you understand what I'm saying? And you know who had the first one? Her best friend, who was also <laughs> a graphic designer. They went to San Francisco, and they bought these computers, and they brought them back. And, you know, it's like the floppies going in and out. Mm -hmm. I mean, and this was in our house, the dial-up. And yeah. I remember my mom saying, you know, you got to get into computers. Computers are the future. And I was like, sociology is the future. I mean, again, in every yeah. way, I was <laughs> off. I just didn't know what I was talking about. It's, uh, tr it's true. But I also, you live and learn. I also thought sociology was the future. And, and look it where is. I am now. Look where we are now. Exactly. It's we true. We did all right. I feel like it worked out. Yeah. I mean, I feel like... Jillian, I and you too. Stay the course. Yeah. We're, we're working on Jillian. So you guys you get on her <laughs> before she leaves tonight. All right. So these are the things that, that lead into thinking about... By the time I have been in uh, corporate America for 15 years, I've been on the internet for a really long time. I um, uh, the 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 recession is starting, and I'm thinking this is like a terrible time to to be alive, mm -hmm. uh, to to do a lot of things. Um, I meet Jillian's dad, and you know, the rest is history. I meet Otis. He's like, we got to go back to Illinois. I say, that sounds great. And this is my chance to kind of reinvent and go back to graduate school, which I'd really, really wanted to do. I, I wanted to get a PhD in sociology, quite frankly, you know, since I was young at Fresno State. But it just, you know, what it's like. You, you start working, you make money, you live in the Bay Area. It's a million dollars for rent. You can't just dip out to graduate school. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so we moved to Illinois to be closer to Jillian and all of the family. And this is when I decide to go back to graduate school. Now, at the moment that I go back, I go to the information school at Illinois. So mm -hmm. I'm in a library and information science program, and everyone is talking about Google like it's the new messiah. Do you know? I mean, it's shocking to mm -hmm. me because I've just mm -hmm. been in advertising where we are redirecting huge portions of our media buying budgets to online media. And Google is like the game that everyone's trying to game. So we're trying to figure mm -hmm. out how to get our clients well-placed. We're yeah. trying to do public relations mm -hmm. that looks like news and get it mm -hmm. stories picked up. Kind of weird, like yep. this, mm -hmm. how this has kind of stayed with us, mm -hmm. let's say. Um, I've just left that business, and now mm -hmm. I'm going to graduate school to think about uh, technology and information and sociology. And, uh, and I'm talking to a good friend, um, Dr. Andre Brock, at the, he's now at Georgia Tech. Mm -hmm. He was just at the University of Michigan. And uh, he, if, you, if you've ever heard about black Twitter, thank Andre Brock, because he wrote the first academic study about black Twitter. Mm -hmm. And he's, he's just a badass and a good friend. And he says, uh, we're talking, and I say, yeah, I, I think I'm going to write about Google. I don't understand why everyone is in love with Google. It's kind of weird to me because they're talking about it like mm -hmm. it's the next public library. And you got to remember, this is around 2008 or nine when the Google Book Digitization Project is in full swing. Universities are opening up their libraries. Everyone's digitizing all of the content. Mm -hmm. That seems weird to me, like in the back of my mind, because I'm thinking, that's a private company, and why is everybody giving all the books to the private company? And um, aren't aren't the libraries going to put themselves out of business once they've digitized all of this content? Yeah, I'm just, just questions. And mm -hmm. then along comes lots of questioning. Just a question, you know, just a thought. It's like, why are you giving away all this stuff that took you so long to accumulate and amass and sort and, and classify? Sort. Catalog. And catalog and make sense of, and there's an entire human infrastructure built around. Huge. Also, don't that. we love libraries? Aren't yes. they beautiful? Married Amazing a librarian. Places. Give it up for the libraries. Highly, highly recommend meeting librarians. The librarians are badass. Everything about the whole library scene is amazing. So I'm trying to understand what's I wouldn't going call on. it a scene. I okay. mean. I mean, it has its own type of scene. Uh, mm. Okay, you're not gonna. No, right. I'm not going She's there. Not it, the lights that. are on all the all time. Right. I feel like if we were in Ohio right now and I called it a scene, everybody yeah. would be down. But because okay. we're in New York, no one can compete with the scene in yeah, New York. So it's this true. is not fair, especially it's not the librarians. Okay, no. all right. So the librarians are cool, and 
I'm interested in, uh, I'm not really interested so much in librarianship, but the information school at Illinois lets you do sociology and technology and librarianship. It's very interdisciplinary, and I'm into that. I want to just, basically, I just want to do what I want to do. That's what's happening in graduate school, like most people. I just want to take the classes I want to take and study what I'm interested in. And, you know, there's amazing people there. Lisa Nakamura is there at Illinois. I'm taking mm -hmm. classes from her. Um, Christian Sandvig is there. I take yeah. a class from Cameron McCarthy, who's a major important voice in education, is there, critical race theorist. Uh, you know, Angie Valdivia is there. They're, you know, one of the most prolific writers about Latinas and the media. There's just a lot of great people there. And I want to take these classes from them. And the iSchool is the place where I can do it. Now, I come into graduate school with uh, my now colleague, Sarah Roberts. So some of you might know Sarah Roberts. She's really the person who writes about commercial co content moderation. And she's really, I mean, she invented this term, commercial mm -hmm. content moderation. And she and I are in graduate school together. And we're like the old ladies in the corner, you know what I mean, who are just... Feisty still. We're real so sassy, you yeah. know what I mean, mm -hmm. uh, in our classes. And we're taking classes from these amazing people like Dan Schiller, uh, you know, great political economist. And, uh, and we're noticing different things, probably because we're a little older than the profile. We've had careers already. And we're, you know, she's interested in these people who do work in the shadows that are taking things down uh, at the, out of social media in particular. And, and weirdly, the public doesn't know that this is happening. And tech companies are deeply invested in hiding the fact that these people do this type of work. I'm interested in how Google is this commercial advertising platform and everyone's relating to it like it's a public information portal. Again, we're just kind of, these are our sensibilities from our own careers that are ask, having us ask these different kinds of questions. And I want to pause you right there because yeah. I got to tell his crazy story. Okay, tell it. Sophia and Sarah organized this conference last December, and the final panel had a few original content moderators. One of them was from MySpace, and she described her midnight team of MySpace um, content moderators, and she had this book where they wrote the rules, hand wrote the rules about content moderation. And she's like, so around midnight, we all get there, and from midnight to 8 a.m., we moderate MySpace. Over and a keg of beer. Over Do a keg of that? beer, and I've got a witch, a uh, transgender person, I've got a white supremacist, and i got a couple of black guys on parole. A couple gang members. A couple of gang members. And she's describing this crew of people that have such a specialized and robust knowledge of the deep textual features that allow communities to spin themselves together online. And it was just really fascinating that you were able to bring someone like that who probably didn't think that job was, I mean, they definitely didn't think that was going to be their career and, of course, had moved on after that, but didn't understand how important that kind of work and that labor was going to be for understanding our contemporary moment. Absolutely. I mean, this is, you know, Sarah really single-handedly organized that conference and it was brilliant and you can watch it online. All of the talks are there and I recommend you do. Um, but yeah, so Roz is there talking about, she's the early content moderator and, and what's interesting and I think with some of the ways that Sarah and I, our work um, overlaps is that um, certainly algorithms are responsible in part for the kinds of things we find online, the way they're written, the way they're optimized, the way they're gamed. But there are, they're also working in tandem with human beings mm -hmm. who are both designing and writing those algorithms, but also who are doing a layer of labor that technology cannot do, that machines cannot do, not, certainly not yet. Um, and so this is where our work has always been very complementary in this kind of this this dance between what human beings are doing and uh, in making algorithms and in let's say shoring up what algorithms can't do. Mm -hmm. And you know that I'll tell you when we started doing that work, this is again we're talking 2010 maybe when we start writing these dissertations. Now I you got to remember this in 2010. 2010 was a time where when I was saying things to my professors, for example, like I want to study racist and sexist bias in algorithms. 
And I want to do that using kind of like black feminist and critical race frameworks. The feedback that I would get from 95% of my faculty no. was no, <laughs> because an algorithm cannot be racist. Of Full stop. Mm -hmm. Now, see, this isn't that funny because people are like, of course it can now. But then no one would agree to that. And I remember having so much pushback. My, my colleagues in my cohort, you know, would kind of secretly make fun of me behind my back. Of course, you don't make fun of me, you guys, because it always gets back to me. And <laughs> not only does it get back to me, sometimes it happens in public and it's embarrassing for the people who make fun of me online. But more than that, it hurts my feelings. Okay, it really does. Like, I'm super sensitive. So, you know, there were people who were just like naysaying and yeah. they were like, this, this woman's not going to have a career and she's ridiculous because a an a algorithm cannot be racist and algorithms are neutral and they're simply tools and there was a total disassociation from makers of algorithms and their values and and yet here we had people again at NYU like Helen Niesenbaum and people like Lucas and Trona and um, Wendy Chun, you know, uh, I mean, there there are several people. Those were the people who were really my inspiration because they were writing about the kinds of uh, biases in technology. Langdon Winner, Arnold Pacey. I mean, these are all the people. I, I always feel like I need to cite these people because it's my own politics of making sure you know. I actually can't think of anything on my own. We all, all of our ideas are interconnected with other people's ideas, and that's why it's important that we write and we talk and we share because we're building on each other and that's very important and so these some of these people were very influential uh, these these instructors but I did find my five percent of the faculty yeah. who would green light and say yes you could write about this and uh, and so you know I uh, this was how this book was born it was born from this dissertation that a lot of people didn't think I should write and didn't think was a legitimate thing and even when I got the book contract in 2000 I think the top of 13 um, Eileen Kalish is my editor at NYU Press, and I love her. And if you know her, she's amazing. She's a women's studies editor, and she's fantastic. And I remember um, I pitched her at the uh, National Women's Studies Association conference. And this is kind of a funny story because these stories don't make it into the book, but they're really like to me the like more interesting parts. Eileen is at she's on the exhibit floor at um, at this conference at NWSA in Oakland, and it's five minutes to six. And at six is when it's closing time and the exhibitors get to go like have a drink and like get off their feet and like wash the day away. So of course I roll up at five minutes to six. <laughs> she, is, she looks beat. She's looking at me like, please God, no, I can't. I cannot yeah. talk to another single person. And I say, and I can see it in her face. I know. So I say, hi, uh, could I just 30 seconds throw an idea at you? If you don't like it, I, I get it. It's no problem. It's closing time. She's like, go. And I said, ever go on the internet and do a search for something that has to do with women and girls and get back porn? Why does that happen? This book is about why that happens and why women and girls are synonymous with porn on the internet. And she goes, oh my God, I'm the women's studies editor. Do you know how much I look at women and girls of all kinds, of all sorts <laughs> yeah, on the internet? She, she and I always think marks. it's my fault. She's, she's like, yeah, marks. she's like, I know exactly what this is about. Yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> yes. Call me. Here's my card. Amazing. And then, and she gave me the book contract and it was just like that. So I really, again, I love her at, for believing in this idea. This is before the guardian and everyone is really writing about biased algorithms and, um, and there's so, and the impact of, of technology and society, you know, I mean, it's kind of, it's just starting to happen. And, uh, and I remember when I, when I was trying to, as the book was kind of wrapping up, I said, you know, this book, this is like 2014, maybe I say this book needs to be called algorithms of oppression. And she was like, Safia, no, no girl, no, because no one knows what an algorithm is. And I was like, now, now what, Papa? Papa's asking about the algorithms, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, my father-in-law is like, what's up with the algorithm, Safia? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, okay. like you built them. Yeah, I yeah. mean, he's like, mm -hmm. I know what the algorithms are. Yep. So at the time, nobody really was talking about algorithms. It wasn't a household word like it is now. And uh, so I did something. This is just like a, you know, pro tip on your own writing. 
I decided I had to have this as the title and I was going to convince Eileen and NYU Press. So I started giving every single talk from 2000 about 13 on as algorithms of oppression. Your CV Way before must be the, the book worst. was out. Like I mean, it just was just like, like it's just a million algorithms <laughs> of oppression. Yeah. And so all my talks are online under algorithms. Of so then there was yeah. so much equity in algorithms of oppression yeah. that they kind of was back, like, couldn't back that. away from that. No. So that, that's how, that, that's how the title a, came. I have a kind of philosophical question for you about search. And because um, search to me, uh, I told this story recently in a book club. So I'm just going to out myself right now. I got my first computer on September 2nd, 1997, and it was a birthday gift, and I put in my AOL 1,000 hours, nice. and I like got on the internet for the first time and was like, what am I going to do? And I was just like, I had, I had seen email over a friend of mine's shoulder. Um, that friend now is the uh, CEO of RunKeeper, so <laughs> he's done okay with him for himself, and uh but you know, I had seen and heard about the internet. I get on AOL for the first time. I don't really know what I'm doing, but I love hardcore music, and so I type in hardcore. Oh snap! And Here we go. I I Here was not a I was ashamed <laughs> for myself, <laughs> you know. And uh, I as I learned how to internet, um, I learned very carefully that search. Uh, isn't always uh, a friend, especially a friend to the lesbians. Uh, that was another thing I was interested in, and don't don't do that. Don't do it. Not on AOL. No, not in 1997. Um, and so I have a yeah, I have this kind of question about search and sort of the uh, more theoretical. Do you think it mirrors our social world, or does it magnify the worst of it? That's such a great question because I think most people think it mirrors the world, but I. Again, I think because I was trained in information science, in library and information science, one of the things that I know, for example, is that uh, search engines were really built on previous information models. So some of the previous information models, for example, are things like uh, citation analysis or citation metrics. And so some of you, the real nerds in here know what that is, and I salute you. So uh, this idea, for example, that scholars, we point to each other in our work by citing each other, right? That's the, that's like, and our pointing by citing is a, is a signal in the system that says this person, it was worthy enough to be cited. Now I, you know, Charlton could be citing me and saying like, Noble's work is trash, right? I mean, you don't really but know. But it still counts. But I'll counts take as it. one. Okay, <laughs> so, but it counts as one. So this is this is one of the things that uh, library and information scientists, for example, know very clearly why you can't trust cit citation analytics because they don't actually tell you whether someone's disagreeing with or agreeing with. They're just there. Now, that's, that's the main model that serves as kind of the information model that computer scientists use for hyperlinking and pointing and whether this becomes a valid way of recognizing what's legitimate content. But they miss the part that we already knew in our field, which is that that is a totally unreliable way of uh, signaling uh, credibility, for example someone might be pointing to something that's not credible. Mm -hmm. And so weirdly, we have that as part of the phenomena in search and other types of technologies. The other thing about that is that you have to classify and, and tag or catalog whatever kind of um, uh, ways you wanna think about content. You have to identify content. Now, in a library, we identify content in a lot of different ways. And we have things like metadata, which help us understand more co context about a, a work, an artifact, an item in a, in a collection. Um, collections at a level, you know, at the level of kind of the body of collection, what's in, what's out. Those are extremely political decisions. And we know this. And we have great library scientists, people I think like Hope Olson, who have helped us understand that the history of the library has been about mostly cataloging uh, 
white Anglo-Saxon male Protestant knowledge, mm -hmm. right? And this has been, of course, the site of struggle for academics in this country for more than a hundred years, for sure, about diversifying what we call a quote unquote canon, um, understanding knowledge, who gets to produce it, who gets it, whose knowledge gets to circulate and be considered legitimate. The library has been a major source of legitimation of knowledge or not. And we know, again, that that is fraught with all kinds of politics, with racism and sexism. But so classification is not pure um, organization of content is not pure, it's not fair, it's not, it, it's a human, it reflects all the human biases. And these are the very foundations of the way in which systems design gets carried out in other fields too. Mm -hmm. Except for the part where we know how, va how values are infused into it and how biased it can be. That's where I think some of the really important work that uh, theoretically that information scientists are doing about acknowledging all of those kinds of biases and value laden decisions uh, don't always translate into math and computer science. I think that part, it, it, you know, it's like, it's like some part of the, the, uh, the logic just falls away. And I, you know, that happens for, I mean, there are people who are much more uh, astute in talking about the history, the, the political history of math, for example, mm -hmm. than I am. But there are certainly people who write about that, that I think we, um, we should be looking into their work mm -hmm. to again, decenter and destabilize this idea that these classification systems upon which search is built are mm -hmm. stable and reliable. Amazing. And so one of the things that we're going to get to Q&A in a minute, but uh, speaker's prerogative because I waited all day for you to get here. I was so <laughs> excited. Um, but one of the things that we were just riffing on earlier was um, we are very much in a crossroads here and you have now uh, sort of opened up a really big space for lots of us to come flooding through <laughs> and back you up and help you do this kind of work and land these critiques where they need to be. And I know that you're pivoting to a project related to e-waste and you're gonna be going to Ghana. And if you wanna talk a bit about where you're going, but where where we can help you um, you know, take these messages and support you as you as you embark on the next project. Thank you. So the book, uh, you know, I often tell people, students in particular, doctoral students, that if you, you know, you need to think about writing a dissertation the way a recording artist thinks about recording a song, because you are going to sing that song a million times <laughs> in your career. And so I've been singing about algorithms of oppression for a long time, it feels like, and yet, uh, I know that it has provided some openings. I think of it as just, uh, you know, moving my grain of sand on the beach along with a lot of others, uh, a, a lot of other people that I really respect. And, and, I, and I do appreciate you all for being interested in the book. I am thinking though that the, the foray here was just to try to get this idea that these technologies are biased and they have political import and they work differently for different people in that I think they exacerbate uh, inequality profoundly. And I'm bringing back a word like oppression that I, I keep wondering why it kind of fell off the radar, you know, I mean, I know why, but I think that, uh, you know, this, I guess this book could have been called Algorithms of Diversity and then it would have been kind of meaningless. Do you see what I'm saying mm -hmm. uh, to me? Um, so I don't use words like diversity per se in my work because I think it flattens the power dynamics at play in global social inequality and injustice. And we know that injustice is a major feature of oppression. Exploitation is a major feature of oppression. And so I'm trying to get us to talk about those features that technology is exacerbating. Uh, and the next project is really about uh, artificial intelligence as a human rights issue and trying to think about the materiality 
of our technologies again and again and again, because like I talked about early on when Sarah and I were doing our work, you know, do our, our, each of our different agendas, um, the people who do the labor that is so integral to the devices, the electronics, the internet of things, the internet of people, right? Those, that work and the resources that it takes is resting quite precariously on um, deeply exploitive economic and social relations. And so the book is really about that. So this summer I'll be in Ghana uh, uh, doing research. I'm looking at e-waste in Ghana. You know, one of the things that I think a lot of people in the global north don't really acknowledge or, or, or take up sufficiently and broadly enough is the way in which every time we upgrade, every time the kind of planned obsolescence happens around our electronics, this is, uh, you know, people's lives are quite frankly uh, hanging in the balance, whether it's the people who do the mining and the extraction in the Congo and Australia and other parts of the world who do very, very precarious, dangerous work to get the minerals that we need to make microprocessor chips, for example, uh, in our electronics. Those folks, I think, the people who are studying that w have mostly been in kind of like development studies um, but I think we need to pull that in more centrally to our critical race and digital studies type of work. And um, think about, again, the global alliances, political alliances, and otherwise that are really important. I mean, when you think about things like, uh, you know, the, the fight against uh, colonialism, right? The kind of anti-colonist movements, those were because people could trace the patterns of exploitation in their local places to other places around the world. And for me, in my work, I really center black people because I think, and I've, I've often say this, I think black people globally are the, the disposable people upon which these technologies are uh, experimented. I think that we become the fodder in many of these, and partly that's because we are uh, systemically uh, disenfranchised in every level and and um, certainly experiencing oppression globally. So if the technology story could include a story of these patterns of, of global exploitation, we might have a possibility for organizing and thinking in global ways, local and global ways, about resisting that. And ultimately, that's what I'm interested in. Because I think... We're at a very important moment where uh, some of these technologies we are not going to be able to call back. And, you know, what will it mean when mm -hmm. all of the most important decisions that human beings need to make about justice, about fairness, about the kinds of worlds we want to live in are, are wholly outsourced to machines, to AI, and we can't... You know, the whole point of deep machine learning is that the machines can think in ways that human beings can't. And if we venerate that to a point that it displaces the way human beings can think, I think we'll have a hard time calling that back if we don't like mm -hmm. the, the output of it. And so that's what the next project is really trying to explore. That's, that sounds like a lot of work. It is a lot of work. And we have, we are you, here for you. And I have a cold. Do you hear it? In a my little voice? bit. Just but a bit. In, in what you're saying, too, I'm thinking a lot about um, Mackenzie's work on inventing accuracy. And you can't uninvent the atom bomb. That's right. You can't, you, can't, you can't walk it back. And then you have to manage all of these other social relations in order to, you know, uh, b stop mutual destruction. And and I, and I, you know, I applaud you for thinking about and applying these, you know, criticisms to some of, some of these other spaces. Because I think myself in particular and some of us struggle with getting out of the, the U.S. mainframe, right? And yeah. this is a really important right. way in which you're going to be able to bring that together. And I think Sarah is also thinking about... Uh, Sarah Roberts, who we were talking about, you know, content moderation. They're going to hire, you know, 10, 20,000 people. Who? What? Where? Right? right. And that's an important thing to start that's thinking right. about. I'm going to turn to Q&A now. So this is my, this is my like, uh, Sally Jesse Raphael moment. 
I didn't wear red glasses, I but I'm it. ready for you, you know, guys. Because when I say Donahue, my students don't even know who that is. Oh, and my then God, I feel like Phil. I'm about 2,000 years oh, old. I miss it's him. fine. They're like Donahue. I mean, people are looking it up right now. Yeah. I know, fine. right? It's fine. Hi, Sophia. Hi. Thank you for your brilliance. I'm inspired to be in a room with a woman who writes so brilliantly. So Thank you. that inspires me. I'm an intersex activist from Zimbabwe, and I'm here seeking asylum. And I have more of a personal question because writing is something that I would want to give a go because I have a situation that is not usually talked about and I want to educate and inspire. And most oftentimes when I do interviews, I've realized that my anger because of the oppression that I come from sometimes overclouds the message that I want to pass along. And I would just wonder what advice would you give me so that next time when I'm speaking, I try to separate my anger and where I'm coming from and then passing the message. Because I do acknowledge that I am angry, but I don't want to make my life all about being angry. Yeah. Because I am that angry black woman, but I want to pass a message as well. Yes, I'm an angry black woman with you, sis. <laughs> okay. So uh, I appreciate that question and I will say that one of the things about writing is that we are often encouraged to uh, be dispassionate and sometimes that dispassion uh, and that stance and that type of coaching that people offer us it's very academic quite frankly uh, is a is is it feels like erasure quite frankly I mean that's what it feels like for me when I was a uh, about Jillian's age, I read Black Feminist Thought. And that book changed my life because I, I realized that I could center the things that I care about as a black woman and that not be uh, the wrong voice, so to speak, right? Because the voice in academia is often not our voice and we don't get to read our voices very often. It's one of the reasons why, for example, Patricia Hill Collins says in that book, I couldn't write a book that black women couldn't read. And I wrote this book trying to be like that, even though when people say it's kind of dense, then I feel like I failed, do you know? Because I wanted to write a book that black women and girls could also read, and I'm also angry about these things. And, uh, you know, one of, my own personally coping, my own coping strategies with my frustration is humor. I mean, it, I do channel, I have a lot of jokes. I, it, my students are just like, stop it. Um, but I'm like, this, this material is good, you guys. It's been workshopped, so you can laugh. Uh, and I do, um, I do think about the importance of the work of being a writer and that we, you know, our, it, my job is to try to communicate something that I think is important. Now, maybe only three people might have found it interesting. I feel very fortunate that just a, a few more than three have found it interesting. But I think if you try to think like, how, what am I working in service of? And so I often try not to think about myself, my own personal struggles. I have a lot of them. Um, I try not to think about like my own family circumstances, you know, the things that are, that can uh, get in the way of the message uh, that I want to communicate. And to me, that message is for more people uh, who might share some of my personal private kinds of experiences. It's very much, you know, the book that um, you could read too, and this is for everyone, um, C. Wright Mills, The Sociological Imagination. That was another one of my, uh, you know, those books that's like just written all over. Because Mills talks about how we have these private experiences of pain and suffering and things that uh, are, are problems. And we, you know, our society conditions us to think of them as a private problem. And then before you know it, we look around, we're talking and we see, actually a lot of people have this private problem and it can become a public 
problem. And when it when we can move it into the realm of a public conversation, we can have much greater impact for all of us. So I would just say if there's a way to, to think about your struggles, that they not be in vain, and that you can channel them into legibility for people who might not understand them at a personal level, but could definitely understand them at a broader, more collective level. You know, I think of myself as writing for people who might not ever uh, write or even know about the kind of nefarious things that I think are happening, but I write for the people that I imagine will be harmed and may never be in a position to know about or e even talk about it. And it, certainly that's also located in my own personal harm. And I wish you the best of luck and call me. Okay. Sure. Uh, thank you so much for all the knowledge that you just shared. I have so many questions, but I'll just ask one. Um, so what you just spoke to about your next project um, really resonated with me because I've been thinking on the same lines and I'm actually next week going to be going to a, co a conference in Seattle called Deconstruct Conf, a software development conference and speaking about computing, climate change and all our relationships and I'm really trying to put the focus on, uh, on the global south. And I'm, I'm wondering, uh, I'm, I'm trying to think like, what like what ask I'm going to make of all these software developers while I have this captive audience for half an hour, and I'm wondering like specifically for folks who are working in 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 these software industries, if you have any suggestions for what work that you think that they could be doing to contribute? Yeah, I think you want to give them a provocation when you have an audience like that, and I'm so glad that you're going and doing that. I mean, the provocations, for example, that I'll raise with my students is I'll hold this up and I'll say, okay, design this so no one dies. Go. You know, making them unpack every dimension of what's in, uh, uh, you know, that they, it's, it's insufficient to want to be an app developer. Okay, if you want to write, you want to write code, you want to develop an app, first of all, what's the problem you're solving? Or is this an app that's in search of, a, of an audience, right? Or, uh, so getting people into more of an intellectual discussion about what are they doing and asking people to try to articulate what they're doing. And then what is, how much energy is this app gonna cost, right? If, if two billion people, for example, like in the case of Facebook, are using it. How much energy, how many devices, how, how many updates are you gonna make to that so that the dev old devices now that the app doesn't work on anymore? Right? What are all of the kinds of politics? How are you gonna source? Do, what are your relationships with hardware? Right? I mean, I think the software companies oftentimes, maybe, maybe not, in deep dialogue with hardware uh, companies, but certainly th there has to be a relationship there because uh, the software is running in relationship to the constraints of the hardware. So there are ways that I think even software developers want to do things differently, but they have all of the, you know, an ecosystem that they're trying to engage in. And I think that when you have the provocations that you can put in front of people, then do that. Um, sometimes, it, you know, I love my friends who are software engineers and computer engineers, but, you know, it's kind of like the finite answers, you know, the, the finiteness of the... Uh, knowing or not knowing, the, the yes or no, the training, you know, maybe there's a way that you, just your presence there and the, the raising of certain kinds of questions can create the provocations that take a longer term approach. You know, leave people with things to really chew on and think about. Um, I think that has impact. I heard, uh, you know, you, if you follow me on Twitter, you know that I, Oprah Winfrey spoke at um, the USC Annenberg uh, commencement last week. Uh, and yes, I was fangirling and it was crazy. And she said something important. She said she was talking to Maya Angelou and she was talking about opening her girls leadership Academy in South Africa. And that, uh, this, she was telling Maya, this is going to be my legacy is this, th this girls Academy. And Maya was like, you don't know what your legacy is going to be. You know, like, how dare you talk about your legacy? And Oprah was like, no, but like, this is really my legacy. And Maya said back to her, you don't know what your legacy is because your legacy is every single person that you're going to touch in your life. And that is a really interesting way of thinking about every conversation matters. It may not transform everything overnight, but it will matter. So just stay in the, those conversations and raise those provocations.
How's it going? So fast. Um, I'm I'm actually here from Montreal. I'm I'm an indigenous community uh, journalist, and uh, I'm I'm a settler myself, but I work as as, as uh, in solidarity, and I work with the Northern um, First Nation, uh, the Cree Nation of uh, uh, sorry, the Cree Nation of Yavisci in north of Quebec uh, near James Bay, and also occasionally with uh, Inuit communities in Nunavik, and in the case of uh, the Cree Nation of Yavisci, they've had high speed about a decade now, and so. Um, you were, you were talking about uh, black Twitter, and we have the phenomenon up there of Cree Facebook. And we don't have the phenomenon of, of um, Cree Twitter. Uh, indigenous Twitter is something that happens actually more in the south, and we call it the south, like around uh, Ottawa, Montreal, Toronto, and those areas. And it tends to be more uh, involving people in, uh, who are in higher, uh, been in higher education, you know? Um, but Facebook is something that is open to people of all, all levels of education and also all styles of knowledge. And uh, there's a really important distinction to make up there when we talk about people who are educated in the, the European manner and uh, people who are educated on the land in the traditional style. Um, and all these people, they're using Facebook together. And y you, you often see that the ones who have a more traditional education in the land, they are the ones who are, who are being taken advantage of more often. They're subject to, uh, to scams. And uh, you know, the sort of the technical uh, literacy that we often take for granted down here just isn't a thing. And so as you're talking about the idea of, of attempting um, to, to serve the global south, I'm also thinking about what I think of as the north and wondering, um, what is the thinking right now? How are people thinking about the idea of introducing people who have less of a long line of uh, technical education to social media in a way that can uh, can be empowering for them, but n also not oppressive to them? Um, thanks. It's a good question. I met someone uh, recently. First of all, uh, you know, thank you for the question because I think that you know we're also here um, on the indigenous land. And, uh, and I'm grateful for an opportunity to do this work as a guest here. And we, you know, one of the things that's a challenge, and we talk about this, a lot of people talk about this, not just me, that uh, these platforms, you know, are, there are many, for many people, they're their only experience of the internet. I'm sorry I can't see you anymore. I feel like, should I stand up or should you? Okay, there you go. All right. Uh, so, you know, the only experience of the internet is Facebook. And of course, that we know that that's what the majority of Facebook's users, in fact, 87% outside of the United States. And uh, the, the getting on the internet is getting on Facebook. Uh, I have not really been a big proponent of saying, you know, delete Facebook and that kind of thing, mostly because I know that this is the way that most people, I mean, it's a very pr privileged group of people who get to just delete their account and think that's going to change something. Kind of like how I may not want to participate in hypercapitalism, but I actually still have to pay my rent next month and I get paid in dollars in, in a paycheck. So I'm a participant whether I want to be or not. Uh, I don't want to be a participant in the most exploitive forms. And so these are the questions, like how do we have people engage without the exploitation? And I'm not sure entirely um, how to do that. I mean, maybe, Joan, you have ideas about that. I, I think that the idea of people not being connected, I mean, he, this is a, the bill of goods that's been sold to us about the internet, is that we can all be connected. Okay, everybody's down for it now. Of course. Yeah. Listen, I mean, my mother-in-law would have probably put a contract out on me if there hadn't been Facebook to share pictures of my son, her, her grandson with. Do you understand what I'm saying? So I know. Uh, and so this bill of goods has been sold to us, and many of us enjoy it, and we participate in it, and it is productive. It doesn't mean, though, that we shouldn't be thinking about the the legal mechanisms that govern it, the ways in which the surveillance happens, the way in which our lives are datafied and sold and our activities are sold. And of course, people who are more vulnerable uh, in our society are more likely to be exploited. So I think that the work is the kind of, with the kind of question you're asking, which is you, you have the sensibility. The journalists have done a lot of important translating work between scholars and the public about um, the limits of possibility and the need for imposing new limits 
legislatively and otherwise, uh, usage wise, our own uh, relationship to these technologies. I think that's what we have to do. I think we have to keep talking about, I mean, this is one of the things that's the problem again about the most vulnerable in our societies become the like experimental groups. I mean, it's not as if, uh, the majority of black people in the United States have really benefited from the largesse of what the internet has created. I mean, what I talk about primarily in the book is we become the commodities that are sold and traded in it. Well, we've been commodities for a long time. We've been bought and sold. Our identities and our bodies have been sold for a long time. So those practices are not going away. And I think that um, this is where the indigenous communities have very deep knowledge and also very powerful forms of resistance to that. And we need to keep those things in mind. Thank you. Thank you. I'm gonna, um, uh, we're gonna wrap, um, but I want Taeyun to ask Taeyun style question because Taeyun has been sort of one of the most um, steadfast optimists that there are m moments when technology can harmonize our social relations and can improve our lives and our capabilities. And so I'm really happy for you to ask the last question. Hi, thank you. Um, 